Good morning. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Guess what we did not see today? <laughs> we did not see snow today. It's about, it feels about 20 degrees colder than it was last week, but there was no snow today on the way into service. But uh, I see a whole lot more people here today. That's a wonderful, beautiful picture uh, to come to the sanctuary and see folks filling in the gaps. Yes, it is. Isn't that a beautiful picture, Ann? A beautiful choir back here. They're almost full. Yeah. Yeah. Man, y'all are coming up short here. Albert, Albert, you got a, got a seat right here for you, buddy. <laughs> right there. <laughs> anyway, we're glad that you're here. It's a great day to be in God's house. We have a great service for you today. We hope that the service will be a blessing to you and your family, and uh, you'll be able to rejoice and be glad, for this is the day the Lord has made. We're going to start by singing a song. Jane, you're leading us today? I and Anne's on the keyboard, so uh, let's sing together to the Lord. Oh, my goodness, this is a great day to sing praises to God. So let's stand up and sing Great is the Lord. <clears throat> Great is the Lord. There's no doubt about that. Our Lord is great. He's worthy of worship and praise, and we appreciate y'all coming and singing to the Lord this day. It is a good, beautiful day. The sun is shining bright, and y'all's faces are shining bright inside the sanctuary this morning. So good to see each and every one of you in God's house today. We're glad that you're with us, and uh, we got a good uh, service for you today. I understand we have another double event weekend. We got the Super Bowl. We had the Super Bowl last week, didn't we? I saw Kramer uh, this, this week, and I, I looked him over, and I noticed that he was not wearing a dog collar. So he's not in the doghouse from Valentine's last week. Uh, so he must have did Ann pretty good. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I don't see any other body. I don't see any dog collars on anybody else. Y'all must have been good this week. We had the Super Bowl last week. We had Valentine's this week, last week. This week we got Daytona, the Super Bowl of NASCAR racing. Yes, indeed. I know y'all all go. Y'all going to want me to finish early, aren't you, so you can get home and watch that race? What time does it start? Twelve. Two. Th y'all know that two thirty. That's a late start. Good golly, that's a late start. I thought. Maybe I'm thinking of Indianapolis 500. Maybe that's why I'm, they usually start around 12, don't they? 
Anyway. So then, uh, and tomorrow is President's Day, where we all get a day off. So that, that's wonderful. But it, it's, it's good to see you in God's house. Uh, we're glad that you're here. Um, been, uh, you know, it's not too many times that the preacher gets bribed, you know. But I, I have been bribed f- before. <laughs> I remember one church I was at. It wasn't any churches in North Carolina. There was a controversy in the church. And I was trying to lead the people with integrity. And you know what one of the deacons, the chairman of the deacons did? He sent me a hundred dollar bill. Be quiet, preacher. Just be quiet. That is not a lie. That is not a lie. I have received gifts before and I appreciate gifts. But a bribe to shut my mouth? We didn't stay there. We did not stay there very long. (laughs) No, we... Uh, actually, we're looking to leave the first week we're there. <laughs> that's not a lie. <laughs> that is not a lie. Anyway, that's just a joke. Yeah, anyway, we got one of our members today trying to bribe me for a steak dinner, seafood dinner, oyster dinner, shrimp dinner, lobster dinner. If I'd wear that WF hat today. Yeah, that WF. Buck, where is that hat? I think I'll take you up on that. Where's that hat? Outside. Oh, it's outside. Okay, it's outside. Oh, okay. <laughs> Go get it for you. While he's going to get it, um, we got a special guest with us today, Brother Bright. Brother Bright had, was a recipient many years ago of your, your love and compassion of the people in the community, and he just wants to share a testimony with us this morning. So, Brother Bright, come on up here. And uh, share with us what the Lord has laid on your heart. Yeah, come on up. Come on up. Bro. Come on. No, no, you need to step right on up here. No, you're not standing on there. You step right on up. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord again, everybody. Yeah. It's good that we could come in the house in unity and be one. Um, I got to share something that happened over 25 years ago. I used to live three houses down. I used to do a lot of work out of town and uh, my kids used to come to this church. They used to play basketball years ago they used to come. And, uh, but daddy used to work and daddy got out there in the world. Daddy won't do what daddy supposed to do. But one Christmas, Christmas time was coming and I won't write, I won't worry but this church, they woke up that Christmas morning and they had gifts on the front porch that this church gave my kids. And I just want to come back to say thank you for showing that love. I don't know who the pastor was back then, but y'all showed so much love to my family. And I hope that spirit is still here because this was a loving church. That song she just sung was my confirmation. I had talked to Pastor, I mean, uh, Mr. Hill, I mean, Mr. Harris, about a month ago, but the doors was closed. I was going to share this testimony, and I told him, well, the first chance I get, I was going to come by and share it. So I got up this morning, and I went to the food line, and I rode by the church, and I seen the cars on the side. I said, they had church today. So I went out to the park, and I sat. And the spirit just said, go back. This is your chance to tell the church, thank you. And that's what I'm here today to say, thank you. Thank you all. I don't know who was here back then. But the love that this church showed my family, I really appreciate it. And I thank God for y'all. Y'all just keep moving, keep doing what you're doing, and be blessed. Which, uh, in, the book of Deuter- in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, Three times a year, a man supposed to come up to the altar, never come to the altar empty-handed. So I'll leave an altar for you. I, this ain't what I want to give, but I will give a bigger one. <laughs> but I give this. And I thank y'all for y'all time. Just, 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 it, it, it's a moment for me, and I thank y'all. My kids is grown and gone there, all up in Fayetteville, went to college, Fayetteville State. It, it's, it's just overwhelming, and I'm good now. Daddy is okay. Thank you. 
Yes, sir. Thank you. God bless. God bless. Yes, indeed. This church is a loving church. They really are. And uh, tw we're trying to figure out who the pastor was 25 years ago. Was it Bob Crisp? Bob Crisp. So, anyway. But, you know, it, it takes a, a, a... I'm not sure the word I'm looking for. Maybe it's brave. Maybe it's strong. Maybe it's well-grounded. Maybe it's a person knowing God to be able to come back and share that testimony, Ms. Uh, Brother Bright. We appreciate that today. Because uh, how many times do we hear of people coming back and giving thanks? You know, it reminds me of that story of Jesus healing those ten lepers. And uh, only one came back to give thanks to the Lord. But folks, do you remember anybody ever coming back and saying thank you? We might have received some cards, maybe. Thank you for helping me. But I don't recall in the years of pastorate, people coming back to the church and saying thank you. So we appreciate you today, Brother Bright, coming and saying thank you to this, this church. Yes, indeed. All right. We um, have a love offering again. We're going to take up another love offering next week. Next week is our designated Sunday. We're going to help uh, Melanie Edwards, her work over in Miramar. I looked that up on the map and found out where it was between Indonesia and India, right there, right there on that spot. So if y'all were wondering where Miramar is, that's where it is. So and if you're still curious, look it up on the map. You can find it. All right, so next week we're going to be taking up a love offering for her in her work overseas. Uh, please make the check payable to Blackwell and designated for Melanie Edwards, and we appreciate you. Steve, any more update on, on her work? Okay, we appreciate your work from last week and the message last week. We pray that uh, everybody will be able to give and give generously. All right. Uh, sign up cards over in the assembly room for Morgan. Uh, please sign those cards and right after the service. When, when is that going to be delivered to them? Does anybody know? Angie's probably in charge of that, isn't she? In, in, a couple weeks. in a couple weeks. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank y'all for being here. We've already had a good Sunday. Jane, I think we're ready to sing another. Well, we're going to have a prayer, aren't we? We're going to have a prayer first, aren't we? Yeah. If it won't for Craig and his, uh, his, his bulletins here, I'd be lost. Sometimes that don't even help. <laughs> Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the day you've given us. We thank you for uh, uh, Brother Bright coming and bringing praise and thanks uh, in your name today, dear Father. We thank you for each and everybody who's, who's come today to worship you. You are our God. You're worthy to be praised. You're worthy to be lifted up. You're worthy to be worshiped. And so today we come, come with friends, we come with family members, lifting up our voices to you. Worshiping you with our hearts and our minds and our soul. Now, dear Father, we ask your blessings upon us this day. We ask that you will inspire us and direct us in the things that we need to do and say. And may we be a reflection of your love in the community in which we live. And we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you love to tell that story? Do you love to tell the story? That's our next song, isn't it? I love to tell the story. Jane, come on up. And don't you love to sing the story? Well, here's your chance. Let's stand up and sing together.
may be seated. God has been good to us, and we have this opportunity to worship God through our giving. Again, we thank you for your faithfulness in your giving, giving of your time, your talents, your work, and your monetary gifts as well. We thank you. Not just we come and collect the tithes and offerings. <laughs> Let us stand together and praise the name of our Lord. Let's pray. God, for the many blessings in which you have given us, we thank you. From the depths of our heart, you have given us so much more than we deserve, and it is with deep gratitude we give you thanks and praise and glory. As a reflection of those blessings, we give back just a portion back to you so that your work might continue, so that your word can be spread, and so that others might know of your redeeming grace. Bless the gift and the giver today, and we make his prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, our choir's got a special piece. It's been a long time since the choir's been up here to sing, hasn't it? Yeah. So good to have y'all today being present and bringing us a blessing.
Thank you, choir. We appreciate y'all being here today. We sure do. Freely, freely. That's a that's a old favorite there, isn't it, Ann? It is. It is. Yes, indeed. Today we're going to be in Luke, the fifth chapter. Uh, we're going to get to that story in just a moment. But in Luke, this story that we read today is multi-layered, multi-faceted. And the, the layer that I want us to focus on most of all today is the layer of the blessing of good friends. Blessing of good friends. I don't know if you know this or not, but it's very, very important to have good friends. As I was preparing for today's message this week and studying the psychology of friendships this week in order to be well adjusted, I started reflecting upon my friends from childhood through high school, through college, and even my friends today. We all need friends no matter how old we are, whether we're children or whether we're senior adults. We need friends. We need them. I was trying to remember who my best friend, my first best friend was. My first best friend was a little boy in the second grade named Carol. Now, Carol was the only black child in the school. I affectionately called him Chocolate Drop. And we were friends. <laughs> we were friends. Yes, indeed. Through elementary school and into high school, there was Johnny and Timmy and James. I have no idea where these people are today, but they were my childhood friends. And they were important to me at that time. My high school friends. My best friend in high school was a fellow named Jim. He was a tree hugger. He loved nature. How ironic it was that right out of high school, he got a job at the, Sur the Surrey Nuclear Plant. Yeah, he became infamous with the dealings of S Surrey Nuclear Plant and had to spend some time in prison for what he did at the Surrey nuclear plant. You might recall the story, I don't know, probably late 70s of Kuykendall and Merrill. They sabotaged the nuclear rods they put into the nuclear reactor, and Jim had to spend some time in prison for that. But he got out, he found Jesus, and... The last I heard, he was doing pretty good. My friends in church, Bobby and David and Steve and Ronnie, they were my friends. I know where a couple of these are right now and hadn't been in contact with them for years. But man, having my friends growing up as a teenager is really, really important. Really important. And in college, it was Ray and Bill. I know where both of these guys are, Ray uh, is a minister of music at one of the church. Ray was ranked, I didn't know it, but, you know, probably most of you don't know it, but he was a ranked ping pong champion uh, in the U.S., and I had to play ping pong with Ray every night, about 20 games of ping pong. So I got pretty good at ping pong since he was ranked and went around the United States playing ping pong. Bill, we played baseball together. Um, he became... He joined the Navy and became a captain in the Navy. And we got together this past summer, as a matter of fact, he and his wife, uh, with my wife, and had a good time together. Now, I've had many friends, but only a handful of friends I could call close. And probably some of my closest friends right now are Daniel and Richard and James. They're probably my close friends right now. And now that Jane and I are at Blackwell, we have new friends here, and we have renewed old friendships as well. And what a blessing y'all have been to us over the last couple of years. Make new friends, keep the old, 
One is silver. One is gold. That's right. All right. Good friends. Good friends. Not like Bill Dad, bad. Not like Bill Dad. No, sir. Or Eliphaz is Ophar. Y'all know who those were? I bet the men in the worship service today know who these are. That was y'all's Sunday school lesson today. Who pointed their finger at one of their best friends, their pious ways, and told Job that he had done something wrong. Don't you need friends like that? You've done something wrong. Do you need friends like that? Uh, uh, I don't need friends like that. Anyway, I don't. Back when I was in high school, there was a hit song by Bill Withers, 1972. I bet some of y'all know that song. Sometimes in our lives, we all have pains, we all have sorrows. But if we are wise, we know that there's always tomorrow. Lean on me when you're not strong. I'll be your friend to help you carry on. For it won't be long till I'm going to need somebody to leave on. Please swallow your pride. If I have things you need to borrow, for no one can feel those of your needs that you won't let show. You just call on me, brother, when you need a hand. We all need somebody to lean on. I just might have a problem that you'll understand. We all need somebody to lean on. Just call on me, brother, when you need a hand. We all need somebody to lean on. Just call me when you need a friend. Call me. Do you all remember that song? Bill Withers. Bill Withers. I didn't know he, he also had some other big hits. I wouldn't even know that he wrote, but that, that was the only song that I really knew that he wrote. Sometimes in your life, we all need somebody to lean on. Friendship is one of those most important things affecting our psychological health and well-being. Did you know friends can also help your physical well-being and health as well? Spending time with our friends releases endorphins in the brain and makes us happy. Did you know that? Do you know why teenagers always love to hang out with their friends? It makes them feel good. Good friendships are essential in every stage of life. Making friends is crucial. Even as little children, it helps us to understand what relationships are all about and how to make friends that will last forever. Childhood friendships may start with play, but it helps the child learn how to be social and to communicate. Did you know hanging out with your friends can help your heart? Did you know that? Yeah, especially if you had a heart attack. It affects your moods, makes you happy, and it just gets better. And it also helps you grow old. Did you know that? If you have good friends. Now, I know the older we get, the less friends we have. Many reasons for that. Sometimes we get sick. Sometimes we move away. Sometimes other takes, you know, other things take them away. Sometimes death takes them away. But it's very important, not the amount of friends that we have, but the quality of friends we have. Oh, I know what social media tells us. Social media tells us if we don't have 200 to 250 friends following us, we just can't feel good about ourselves. You know what I got to say about that? Baloney. <laughs> Baloney. Psychology today says that if you have three people in your life that you can call a close friend, just three people that you can call as close friends, who you can depend on, who they can depend on you, you truly are a wealthy person. Y'all got three friends? You got two friends? 
very few of us, I want to tell you, very few of us have 50 friends, very close friends, very, very few. I don't know. I, I know I don't have 50 friends like that. I, I just don't. In our scripture lesson today, Luke, the fifth chapter, starting with verse 17, we find a man who has been paralyzed. He has four friends. And the five of them went to see Jesus one day. They picked up the man who had been laying on his bed, and they took him to see Jesus. When they got there, the house was full. They couldn't make it inside, so they got together and came up with a plan. Let's climb up on the roof. Sounds like a good plan. <laughs> Let's climb up on the roof and drop him down at the feet of Jesus. Anyway, it's an exciting story. It's a challenging story. It's a, a multi-layered, multi-faceted story. So let's read the story. Luke chapter 5, starting with verse 17. One day Jesus was teaching, and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there. Notice they got a seat. Notice that. The Pharisees and the teachers, they got a seat in the house. They had come from every village of Galilee, from Judea to Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men, carrying a paralyzed man on a mat, and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof, they lowered him on his mat, threw the tiles in the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Mm. Now the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, hmm, who does this guy think he is? Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? But I want you to know, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And so he said to the paralyzed, I tell you, get up. Take your mat and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave thanks and praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. What a wonderful story. That it really is. And, and there are many things that pops out of, my, out of this story that, that comes to the forefront. First of all, Jesus was healing and teaching. He was in a house and not the synagogue. The house was full. A paralyzed man and his four friends went to see Jesus. There was adversity but there was also perseverance. Four men carried their friend, but they could not get into the house. So they came up with a plan to get on top of the roof. And when they got on top of the roof, they had to dig a hole. And once they dig a hole, they had to drop him or lower him. There was faith. There was healing. There was forgiveness. There was controversy, but everybody was amazed that day. They praised God. They were filled with awe because they saw some remarkable things. I would say that's a pretty full day, wouldn't you? That's a pretty full day. When's the last time you could leave the sanctuary and say, man, we saw some amazing things today in the worship service today? That'd be something, wouldn't it? Yeah. As I, I, I read this story this week, I was always under the impression that 
it was the four friends who got the paralyzed man to say, let's go see Jesus. I'm going to call the paralyzed man Joe, okay? I'm going to call him Joe. Was it the friends who said, come on, Joe, let's go see Jesus. We're hearing some good things about him. We'll take you to him. We have faith that he can heal you. We can get you back on your feet, and your life will take off. It really will. That's why I was always under the impression. But as I read the story this week and as I studied it this week, maybe it was the paralyzed man who said to his friends, come on, guys, take me to Jesus. I got to see him. I've heard some wonderful things about this Jesus. He's got the power to heal. I want to be healed. Will you take me to him? He's the only chance I have. He's the only hope I've got. Will you take me? Will you take me to see him? Will you put me in front of him? Have you ever thought of that? We're not told who came up with the idea to see Jesus. But either one of these stories, man, they, they, were, they were, had a sense of urgency. Whether it was the friend's idea or whether it was the paralyzed man, there was a sense of urgency. We must see Jesus. Word was spreading around the region about Jesus. People wanted to see his miracles, maybe wanted to experience one of the miracles, perhaps even wanted to hear what he was teaching. So much so that everywhere that Jesus went, the crowds were sure to follow. Of course, this made the religious authorities a bit uneasy, and they wanted to see for themselves what this guy Jesus was doing and teaching. They got a seat in the house. In that crowded house, they got a seat. The friends arrived in town. The five friends. We're not told how they became friends. But the four Mobile friends had made up their mind that they were going to take their friend to see Jesus that day. Nothing, absolutely nothing was going to stop them. So they gathered up the friend. They took him to the house, the place where Jesus was teaching, performing miracles. And when they got there, they I mean, can you imagine carrying a guy, a paralyzed guy? It's pretty heavy. I don't know if you've got to carry dead weight, Augie, in your, in your work or not. But I, I, I know carrying a dead weight person is pretty difficult. It, it's difficult. And I'm not sure, we're not told how, long, how far they had to travel, but I can imagine them getting a corner of the man's bed, all four of them, grabbing the corner and carrying them up the road to see Jesus. And so there's a sense of urgency, a sense of excitement. That they're getting there, they're getting there, they're getting there. When they get there, they can't get in because it was so crowded. They had a crowding problem. Now, wouldn't that be nice to have in the church, an overcrowding problem? Not too many churches today have that problem, but it would be a nice problem. I remember the day when I was here with these young people, the whole sanctuary was full. The balcony was full. And them guys, Augie and Edwin. What was the other boy's name? McConnell, Scott. <laughs> they were all up there. Sometimes they'd be listening and sometimes be cutting up. But it was all right. They were here. They were here. The sanctuary was full. It was a great time. Great time for the church. It was. My former church, Ballard Bridge, that formed before the presidency of the United States. They had a protracted revival one time. Y'all ever heard of a protracted revival? I never heard of a protracted revival before. Anybody know what a protracted revival? Well, a pro I, I learned something when I went there. I learned what a protracted revival was. A protracted revival was one that continued on until they decided not to have it anymore. Anyway, in this protracted revival, shortly after the church began, they had 400 people come to Jesus. 
Now you're talking about revival. That's pretty good revival. I've never seen a revival like that. 400 people. That's <laughs> something else. That would be a crowding problem, wouldn't it? 400. But anyway, we don't have that problem nowadays here or most, most churches. Nevertheless, these guys wanted to see Jesus, but they came and <laughs> ran into an obstacles. But guess what? They did not let the obstacles stop them. They loved their friend. They knew that Jesus could help. They said, we're going to see Jesus. They did not let an obstacle stop them. They persevered. What shall we do now? They came up with some creative thinking. And it does not tell us which one of those five guys said, let's get on the roof and drop him through the ceiling. We're not told that, but that was the plan they came up with. I don't know about you, but I, I'm not much on climbing roofs today. You know, maybe one day, a hundred years ago, I could have done it, but carrying a person up on a roof, yeah, I know, it was probably a flat roof similar to our family, our, our education building. But still, you got to get yourself up there and you got to carry somebody up there. No problem, no problem. We're going to get our friend to see Jesus. And so they drag his friend on up there on the roof. Oh, what are we going to do now? We're in a solid roof. We're up here and there's a solid roof. They did not let that obstacle stop them. What did they do? Let's dig a hole in the roof. <laughs> I wonder who, who came up with that idea. <laughs> but nevertheless, they did not stop. They persevered. And they started digging a hole in that roof. I can only imagine what the people must have been thinking that day. As they were sitting in that house and stuff was falling in off the ceiling. And before long, there's a hole in the ceiling. They could see the sunlight shining through. They could see five faces peering in at them. Now, that was something, wasn't it? But guess what? They got another problem. How are we going to get our friend down on that floor in front of Jesus? We're not told how they did that, but they did it. They persevered, and they dropped their friend down at the feet of Jesus, right in front of everybody, right in front of God and the congregation that was sitting in that house that day. They would have done anything for their friend that day. They had a sense of urgency to get their friend in front of Jesus. And so they did. Let me ask you something this morning. Do you have a friend that needs to find Jesus? Do you have a sense of urgency to get them there, to find Jesus? Do you have a sense that nothing will stop you achieve this task? Hmm. Getting to the roof, difficulty. But they did it. Could you imagine this morning sitting here and some of those wood planks up there started falling in? What, what, what would you think? What would you think this morning if that were happening? It was dramatic. There was no doubt about it. It was dramatic. And they lowered their feet right there, lowered, lowered their friend in front of the feet of Jesus, right at the feet of Jesus. That's what friends are for. That's an old Dion Warwick song, isn't it? That's what friends are for. Y'all remember? Yeah, y'all remember that song, yeah. But notice the words that Jesus spoke. When Jesus saw their faith, not just the paralyzed man's faith, but all five of their faiths. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. What? Everybody was expecting, friend, stand up and go home. That's what everybody was expecting to hear. But Jesus saw their faith and he said, your sins are forgiven. 
and the religious authorities sitting in their chairs all puffed up. Who does this guy think he is? Nobody can forgive sins but God alone. Huh. Over in Mark, they accused Jesus of being a disciple of the devil. In Luke's version, they just called him a blasphemer. The religious authorities had a problem. And for whatever reason, they were blinded to see who Jesus truly was. God incarnate. Jesus knew what they were up to, but he always had an answer for them. And here is the epiphany for today. It's in verse 24, but we're going to read again 23 and 24. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or get up and walk. But I want you to know, Pharisees and scribes, that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. There is the epiphany. He is saying to them, I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God. I am the one that you're expecting, and you can't even see it. What should have been a very special event for all involved turned into a theological argument thanks to the scribes and Pharisees. And then Jesus spoke to the paralyzed man. I tell you, buddy, get up. Go ahead and pick up your stuff. Stand up and get on out of here. And guess what? Immediately, Immediately, he stood up, he grabbed his mouth, and he walked out of there. And he went home praising God. How about that? How about that? Everyone was amazed. Everyone was amazed. And they praised God. They were filled with awe and said, we have truly seen something remarkable today. There was a kid song, Rise and Shine. Y'all remember that song? Rise and shine and give God the glory, glory, rise. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so, some of y'all music people know that song. Yeah. You know, as good as Bill Withers' song was back in the 70s, I know a better song than that. It came right out of our hymn book. What a friend. We have in Jesus. all our sins and griefs to bear. And what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials, temptations? Yeah. Yeah. Is there trouble anywhere? Yeah. We should never be discouraged. We shouldn't, but we are. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful? No. No one like Jesus. Who will our sorrows bear? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. What a wonderful story we have today. If you have one or two close friends, count your blessings. Count your blessings. But even as close as those friends are, there is not a friend so faithful as Jesus our Lord. He has taken our every weakness. He has paid a price that we could not pay and made us righteous and just before the Lord God Almighty. Let's pray. God, thank you for the people you have placed in our lives. Yes, friends. Friends we can go to, friends we can share things with, things that we can lean on, and they can lean on us. 
we thank you for being and giving us these blessings of people in our lives that mean so much to us. But Lord, we thank you for Jesus, the most magnificent friend that anyone could ever have. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending your son to this world. And may we count our blessings again for allowing us to know him, the redemption, the love that he has to give. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now is the time of response. His name is wonderful. As we sing, think about your friends that God has placed in your life. Give him thanks. And give him thanks for the most blessed friend, Jesus, for what a friend we have in him. Let's stand us together and sing. His name is wonderful. Thank the Lord for good friends. You know, I get to sleep with my best friend. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> I get to eat meals with my best friend. I get to drive with my best friend. I get to live with my best friend. Thank the Lord for your friends. I do. Have a blessed week. And give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the day you've given us. I thank you for our time today. Again, we thank you for the people that you have placed in our lives. That hold us accountable, that give us directions, that give us love and support we need it most. And we give back to them the same things. God, as we leave this place today, give us your grace and your mercy to be a reflection of your grace and mercy in the world in which we live. Watch over us, keep us safe, for it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God blessings. Have a good week.